Her name is Maria Andreevna Ostrakova. We were born in Leningrad on May 8, 1927. Ostrakova, I bring you greetings from your daughter Alexandra in Moscow. Also from hey, certain official madame. callers. Trop chaud pour faire I wish to speak to you concerning your daughter. Hey, hey, not for hey, this car. Hey, hey, Alexandra has serious problems that require the assistance of a mother. Hey, man. lived an immoral life in Russia. Maybe in a town full of whores, they don't mind. In 1948, age 21, you married the traitor Ostrakov Igor. In 1950, the said Ostrakov traitorously defected to France with the assistance of reactionary emigration, leaving you behind in Moscow. Despite the improbability your request will be granted, you applied for a foreign travel passport to join your husband in France. Correct? He had cancer. If I had not made the application, I would have been failing in my duty as a wife. Monsieur, I would prefer a citron. Meanwhile. Meanwhile. Despite your pretended concern for your husband, the traitor Ostrakov, you nevertheless formed an adulterous relationship with Glickman Joseph, a Jew with four convictions for antisocial behavior. In consequence of this adulterous union, you bore a daughter, Alexandra. Correct or false? Where is she? 
Where is Glickman? What have you done with him? In January 1956, as an act of clemency, you were granted a passport on condition that the child Alexandra remained behind in Moscow. You exceeded the permitted time, remained in France abandoning your child. You have received no communication from her. I was advised only that she had entered a state orphanage and had acquired another name. Unless the ways of the authorities are changed considerably, for all she knows, I am dead. But you're not. It is your lover, the Jew, Breckman, who is dead. Concerning your criminal daughter, Alexandra. Criminal? On November the 20th, 1966, for escaping from the state orphanage. Six months corrected detention. One year. Detention by reason of bad behavior. <laughs> what is your decision? I didn't hear. I'm sorry. Kindly. Will you repeat what you just said? Assuming it has been decided to rid the Soviet Union of the disruptive and unsocial element, how would you like your daughter Alexandra to join you here in France? Alexandra? Here? To me? You wish formally to apply for her? Oh, yes. Yes. Tomorrow you will go to the Soviet Embassy and you will ask for Atashe Kuznetsov. Atashe Kuznetsov is authorized to make certain reunions of a compassionate nature. You will not mention this meeting. You will give no indication of special treatment. Atashe Kuznetsov will require you to fill in certain forms. He will also supply you with a photograph of your daughter Alexandra. You will take these forms with you to the French Ministry of the Interior. We will pledge yourself to certain undertakings. the names of both your parents, and here, the date of your marriage to your late husband. These are photographs of your daughter, that you must take with the forms to the French Ministry of the Interior. been less than polite to you. I apologize. There have been times also when I doubted your existence. But 
don't let me doubt the existence of my daughter. There was a general my husband used to know, Sergei, formerly of the Red Army. He came to Paris and started an emigre organization here. Vladimir. What happened to him? He tried to start the Third World War. The French didn't like it. They banned his outfit. He went to London. My husband said he was strong, a man to trust. Not with your wife, he wasn't. Find him for me. I want his address urgently. Ask for yourself, not for me. Sure. Good morning, my general. Madam, I wish to call Hamburg and afterwards to be advised of the costs of this call. Sit, Bobchik. by hand to your place of work. At your beach. It's a shop, no?
You received my letter safely, madame? You are very small for a general. I'm not the general, madame. I'm his lieutenant. Yes, that is him. Who is he? What does he want with my daughter? How do you know him so well? You know what we used to say in the camps? Questions are never dangerous, only the answers. That was not her photograph. That was never Glickman's child. I saw Glickman's child. I bore her. She looked like three Jews at once. He said to me, be discreet. Any indiscretion, your daughter will not be released. I've not been discreet. I've written to the general. I'm talking to you. I'm not used to conspiracy. I hate it. Listen. Can't you tell me your name? I want my child. That swine reminded me that I'm a mother. There's part of this old sinner that longs to believe his lies. Tell me what to do. I told you too much already. All that matters is that you have identified him. Listen, there is a crisis. You are to write to the general at this address in London. Call him Miller, Mr. Miller. On no account use the telephone, you understand? Never. Don't deceive yourself. The danger is not over. It's just begun. Don't open your door to strangers. Be alert. Have courage. Who else is in danger? All of us. All who have knowledge of this affair. And my daughter? No. Alexandra has no part in this. She knows nothing. I shall think of you as the magician. And pray that your tricks succeed. to you as your father's comrade in arms, as his general, his friend. Do you hear me? You arrive in Hamburg Wednesday morning. Understood? I said understood. Madi, I am sorry I am English. I don't want, no, positively. Get the thing off the road. <laughs> Crazy. Have you forgotten? How oh, the Russian monster raped our country. The deportations, the murders, the camps. Our best men executed. Your father, one of them. Have you forgotten that to your disgrace? You listen to me. At the making of history, God used some very strange and inappropriate creatures. You are going to be one of them. Yes? Yes. Repeat. Yes. Ostrakova, a gentleman was inquiring for you. They were two, very similar, official. They are still there.
Well, then. This is Gregory calling for Max. Please, I have something very important for him. Uh, where are you calling from? It doesn't matter. I have plenty of change. I must speak to Max urgently. Uh, please hold on. Well, Max can't speak to you at the moment. Uh, sorry. If you could call back at... Uh... 2.30. Yes, possibly then. Tell Max. Yes, 2.30. Look, Max isn't here. I'm sorry. There must be a meeting. Tonight. A meeting or nothing. I insist on Moscow rules. Tell Max I've been in touch with certain friends. Yes, and through friends, with neighbors. Tell this to Max. A meeting. Yes, yeah, a, a meeting can be arranged, yes. Uh, could you call back in an hour, please? Hello? Mr. Strickland, sir. Mm -hmm. This is Mostyn of Odbins here, sir. I have a requisition for the safe flat in Hampstead tonight. Uh, no, sir. I'm afraid he's insisting on Moscow rules. BBC заканчивает свою передачу из Лондона. Слушайте нас снова завтра в 6 часов 45 минут утра по московскому времени на коротких волнах в следующих диапазонах 31, 41 и 49 метров. Спокойной ночи, всего наилучшего.
Dodd. It's Oliver Lakin. George, are you awake? It's uh, an emergency, George. Shh. Uh, you remember the old general who used to live in Paris? We need someone from his past, someone who knew his little ways, uh, can speak for him. We need you, George. <laughs> Knew him personally at all, sir, or shouldn't I inquire? He was somebody I worked with. So I was given to understand. Well, most likely they started to search him and then they were probably disturbed. If I might take a look at his face, Superintendent. You sure about that, sir? Yes. Yes, I am sure. Oh, Sergeant Pike, come down here. Turn him over. You'll have to try harder than that, lad. Come on, lad, put some muscle into it. Oh, Christ. Oh, bloody hell. Get it away. Take it away fast now. <coughs> Sorry about that, sir. He's young. Most people expect to be shot in the chest. A unique round bullet that drills a tasteful hole. It's a television that does it, I suppose. Where's your modern bullet? Tear off an arm or a leg. Don't happen to know what did this, dear. I haven't seen a wound like that in a long time. I'm afraid ballistics is not my province. No, of course. Wouldn't be, would it? You, uh, silly enough, sir. Did he have a moustache? My sergeant fancied a trace of white whisker on the upper jaw. A military moustache. Well, most likely you'd uh, like to know how the old gentleman got down here, as far as we can tell. Thank you, Superintendent, yes. Sergeant Pike. Yes, sir. Cover him up and tell young Constable Hall I may not be able to stop him sicking up, but I will not tolerate irreverent language. Oh, no, sir. Right, I shall now give you the authorised version. You ready, Mr. Smiley? Here he comes, down the hill. Easy pace. Nice and easy toe and heel movement. Everything above board, see, Mr. Smiley? The stick marks in his left hand, whereas it was in his right hand when he was shot. You saw that too, I noticed. Have you any idea um, which leg was the bad one? The left. So he probably would have carried his stick in his left. And uh, how old did you say he was, sir? I didn't, but he owned to 70. Plus a recent heart attack, I gather. Then suddenly he stops. Now, my guess is that he heard something behind him. I mean, notice how the pace shortens. Notice the distance between his feet as he makes a sort of half turn, probably looking over his shoulder. Then he decides to make a dash for it. An entirely new print. He's going for all he's worth. Unfortunately, whatever killed him was in front of him, wasn't it? Not behind at all. Now, how do you explain this? Stops again. Not a total stop, just a sort of stutter. Then off he goes. With the stick in his right hand. Exactly. Now, why, when you're running for your life, why pause, do a sort of duck shuffle, change hands, and then run straight into the arms of whoever shot him? Any explanation from your side of the street, Mr. Smiley? If I might see the content of his pockets, Superintendent. Certainly, sir. One uh, Borough of Paddington library card in the name of V. Miller. One box of Swan Vestas, partly used, overcoat left. 
One alien's registration card in the name of Vladimir Miller. Overcoat left. Oh, now these tablets, sir. What do you think these are for? The name's Sustak, three times a day. Hard. Ah, oh yes, of course. Uh, one receipt for £17.85 from the straight and steady minicab service of Islington North. May I see that? One stick of school chalk, yellow, overcoat left. One handkerchief with chalk powder. There was some chalk powder marks on his left hand, too. We did wonder whether he might be in the teaching line, actually. Oh, and a couple of dog biscuits. Uh, no maker's name. I did notice bite marks on his walking stick. <laughs> Funny, I never thought of foreigners liking dogs. Did you, sir? Uh, no, I don't suppose I did. Crime and ops on the air, sir. Oh, right. Excuse me. You're a specialist of some sort. No, I, I'm afraid not. A home office, sir. Alas, not the home office either. Superiors are a little worried about the press, Mr. Smiley. Apparently, they're heading this way. Thank you. You've been very kind. Privilege. Sergeant! Get this lot wrapped up. Yes, sir. I know, Chief, not yet. Oh. Uh, perhaps he's lost his way. <laughs> No, Chief, no, not like old George. <laughs> Any compromising materials on the body, George? Anything to link him with us? My God, to have been a time. Oh, you'd uh, like to refresh yourself, I imagine, the, uh, the bathroom. Thank uh, you, Oliver, I remember. Yes, Chief, yes, he is with us at this moment, Chief. Yes, I shall tell him that, Chief. George, you look worried. Don't be. We're all in the clear yes. on this. How did the police behave? Impeccably, thank you. Indeed. Sir, I shall convey to him that message, sir. Huh? Will you have tea, Mr. Smiley, or something stronger? He'll have tea only, thank you, Mostyn. After shock, tea is a deal safer. With sugar, eh, George? Sugar replaces lost energy? I've hardly said hello. George, old friend, <laughs> my goodness. Hello, Oliver. Uh, George, Mr. Saul sends his warmest personal salutations, George. And at quite a moment, he'll express his gratitude to you more fittingly. It is still Enderby in charge, is it? Yes, yeah, yes, cool. it is still Sir Saul Enderby. He's doing marbles. Well, uh, not quite your style, of course. Uh, he's an Atlantic man. Right? Mostyn, where's tea? We seem to have been waiting forever. Yeah, well, the point about the press is not to play him down too far. Hmm? How's Anne? With you and so forth, I trust? Oh, no, no, not uh, roaming? Fine, thank you. God, how I hate autumn. How's the... Uh... <laughs> Abandoned me, damn it. Run off with a pesky riding instructor plaster, left me with the children. Well, the girls are farmed out to boarding schools, thank God. I'm sorry. Oh, Why should you be? Not your wife. Could you close that window, please? It's bloody arctic over here. Yes, sir. Well, I'll get over to that right away. Of course I will. Yes, it'll... Uh... What section are you in? Oddbins, uh, uh, since your day. It's a sort of operational pool. I see. Uh, I heard you lecture at Sarratt's, uh, at the new entrance training course. It 
was the best thing of the whole two years. Thank you. You, Marston, young Nigel, commit nothing to paper, whatever, do you hear me? That's an order from on high. There was no encounter, so there's no call to fill in an encounter sheet or any of that stuff. Marston was Vladimir's case officer? Only for this evening. Two sugars. You mean to say you farmed out the old man to Marston? Oliver, I wonder if you'd mind telling me what I'm doing here. Three years ago, George. Let's start there, soon after you left the circus. Saul Enderby, your worthy successor, under pressure from a concerned cabinet, decided on certain far-reaching changes of intelligence practice. Marston, you close your ears to this. I'm talking high, high policy. Now, one of the far-reaching changes, George, was the decision to form an interministerial steering committee placed between the intelligence fraternity and cabinet, known as the wise men. Wise man, Fanny. Bunch of flannel merchants. Tell us how to run the shop. Smack our wrists when we don't do our sums right. You don't like it, George. I can tell by your face. I'm out of it. I'm not qualified to judge. Now, as a result of this, certain categories of clandestine operation were ruled ipso facto out of bounds. Verboten, right? No court trailing, no honey traps, no stimulated defections, no emigres, no bugger all. What's that? Let's not be simplistic, please, Lorda. The wise men composed a catalogue of proscribed practices, right? The exile groups have been dustbin, George. A lot of them. Orders from on high. No contact, not even at arm's length. Special two-key archive for them on the fifth floor. No officer access without consent in writing from the chief. What a nonsense. George, now steady. What utter nonsense. Vladimir wasn't expensive. He wasn't an indulgence either. You know as well as I do what he was worth. George, I admired the man. Never his group, certainly never his obsessions. Now, there is an absolute distinction here. The man, yes, not the company he kept. The fantasists, the down-at-heel princelings, never. The wise men have a point, George. You can't deny it. Vladimir was one of the best agents we ever had. Because he was yours, you mean? Because he was good. He was potty. He was loyal and honourable. In a shifting world, he held fast, so yes, maybe he was potty. George! In the Red Army, he fought the Germans like a lion. We used to admire that. He dreamed of the great Russian liberalisation. He got Stalin instead. He wanted Estonia set free. It never happened. One night, in despair, he offered us his services. Us, the British, in Moscow. For five years after that, he spied for us from the very heart of the capital. He refused all payment, risked everything for us every day. George, this is history. This is not today. Until he was blown and fled to Paris, Vladimir was the best source we had on Soviet capabilities and intentions. He was close to their intelligence community and reported on that, too. Oh, damn it, George, that whole era is dead. And so is Vladimir. And I wish to God we got half his courage and one tenth of his integrity. George, we are pragmatists. We adapt. We are not the keepers of some sacred flame. I, I ask you, I commend you to remember this. Oliver, tell me what I am doing here. All right, Mustin. Tell him. Vladimir telephoned the circus at lunchtime today, sir. You mean yesterday? Be precise, will you? Yeah, I'm sorry, sir. Yesterday. Yeah, we'll get it right. He came through on the lifeline. I don't think I quite know what you mean. It's a system for keeping in touch with dead agents, sir. Oh, my lord. Agents who have run their course but are still on the welfare roll. So he telephoned and you took the call. What time was that? 1.15, exactly, sir. He said, this is Gregory calling for Max. I have something very urgent for him. Please get me Max immediately. I told him to hold on. I typed out Gregory, and up it came on the selector. Gregory equals Vladimir, 
ex-agent, ex-Soviet general, ex-leader, Riga Group. I typed out Max and found you, sir. Then I typed out Riga Group and discovered you were their last vicar. You, George? Their last vicar? I thought you'd heard all this, Oliver. In a crisis, one deals only with essentials. Organizations such as the Riga Group had, by tradition, two case officers. A postman who did up the nuts and bolts for them, and their vicar, who stood above the fight, their father figure. Who was his most recent postman? Toby Esterhase, uh, work name Hector. He seems to have retired. Retired, my arse. Filched half the circus budget, currently peddling fake Picassos to the discerning rich. Strickland, hush! Vladimir didn't ask for Hector. He asked for you, sir. He wanted Max and nobody else. Did you make notes? No, he didn't. A lifeline is taped automatically, sir. It's also linked to a speaking clock, so we get the exact timing as well. So has anyone listened to the tapes? No disrespect to Marston, of course. They have not, and they won't. Go on, Marston. My section head was out to lunch and not due back till 2.15. I stalled. The trouble was my section head... Who shall remain nameless? He didn't get back from lunch till 3.15. So when Vladimir rang in at 2.30, I had to put him off again. All of which you duly reported to your section head? Yes, sir. Did you play him the tape? He didn't have time to hear it. He had to leave straight away for a long weekend. Well, there's no question, George, for looking for scapegoats. Now, that section head of Moston's made a monumental fool of himself. So how did the dialogue with Vladimir go the third time he called? He was furious, shouting at me down the phone. A meeting or nothing, tonight or nothing. Moscow rules. I insist on Moscow rules. Tell this to Max. Tell what to Max? He meant... Tell Max, I insist it's Moscow rules. <laughs> well, whoever heard the Moscow rules in the middle of Bloody Hampstead, anyway? <laughs> Bloody Hampstead's right. What, um, what are Moscow rules? Procedures to be observed in territories of extreme risk, sir, uh, going by the book all the way. Now, Morstan, wrap the story up. The encounter was fixed for 10.20. There's a tin pavilion on Hampstead Heath, five minutes' walk from East Heath Road. The safety signal was one new drawing pin shoved high in the first support on the right as you entered. And the counter signal? A bloody hunting horn. <laughs> A yellow chalk mark. I gather yellow was the sort of group trademark from the old days. I put up the pin and came back here and waited. I never met him. He was my first agent. We used classic trade craft and he's dead. It's incredible. I feel like a complete Jonah. Well, what's it to be, George? You choose. On the one hand, Vladimir asked for a chat with you. Retired buddies, chin wag about old times, why not? And in order to raise a bit of a wind, as any of us might, he pretended he had something for you. He wouldn't do that. On this basis, my minister would back us. He'll help us to bury the case. He may even decide there's no point in troubling the wise men with it at all. Amen. If, on the other hand, things were to come unstuck and the minister got it into his head that we were engaging his good offices in order to clear up traces of some unlicensed venture which had aborted and there was a scandal, well, it would be just one scandal too many. The circus is a weak child still, George. At this stage of its rebirth, it could die of the common cold. If it does, your generation will not be least to blame. You have a duty, as we all do, a loyalty. And the weapon? How do you account for that? What weapon? There was no weapon. He was shot by one of his own buddies, most likely. He was shot in the face at extremely close range and cursorily searched. That's the police diagnosis. But our diagnosis would be somewhat different, wouldn't it, Lorda? No way. Well, mine would. Let's hear it, George. For one thing, he was on his way here to be your guest. Self-invaded. For another, the weapon used to kill him was a standard Moscow Center assassination device. 
a soft-nosed bullet fired at point-blank range to obliterate, to punish, and to discourage others. But, George, these people, these emigres, don't they come from Russia? Haven't half of them been in touch with Moscow center, with or without our knowledge? A weapon like that? I'm not saying you're right, of course, but a weapon like that, in their world, could be standard equipment. Lord, there's the question of the denoters to the press outstanding. Perhaps you should have another shot at them, see how far it's got. Uh, Marston, perhaps you should take these things out into the kitchen. We don't want to leave needless traces, do we? You were his vicar? Very well, I'm asking you to go and read the offices. He wanted you, George, not us. In that sense, I suppose it could even be argued that you were responsible for... Forgive me, that was unfair. What do you want me to do? I wanted to bury him in both senses. I wanted to pour oil on the waters, not muddy them. Tell me what you want me to do, Oliver. It's what I don't want you to do. He was a man with an obsession. So were you once. You know who his buddies are, who he hunted with. Speak to them. If there's any milk being spilled, I trust you to get it back into the bottle. You're his executor, George. Tidy him up. Keep us out of it. And don't wonder. What else did Vladimir say to you on the telephone? He said, tell Max it concerns the Sandman. Tell him I have two proofs and can bring them with me. It was on the tape, but Strickland erased it. Two proofs. Do you know what Vladimir meant by that? Keep your voice down. Yes, sir. Do they know what he meant? Strickland may. Did Vladimir really not ask for Hector? No, sir. Just Max. Lord. Good man. Farewell. Uh, listen, I want to talk to you about marriage sometime. Uh, a seminar with no holds barred. I'm, I'm counting on you to teach me the art of it. We'll get together sometime. Later. I can always get you at home.
Yes, Oliver. Always. <laughs>